Thank you. Um, so the original um, title of the talk was supposed to be uh, techniques for writing concurrent applications with asynchronous I/O, but this is obviously uh, way too long, and also uh, I had to change the, uh, all the contents of the talk for reasons that hopefully will be uh, apparent later. Um, so first, I'd like to know about uh, you. Uh, who has um, already used asynchronous I/O in Rust? Okay, and who has used asynchronous I/O in something other than Rust? Maybe not JS. Maybe. Okay, cool. Um, so this talk is about asynchronous I/O in the context of uh, networking. So I won't talk about uh, file operations. Uh, if we do have time for questions, um, maybe we can talk about it. Also, I've put some Rust uh, code examples um, in this talk that are available on GitHub. And um, so, as Ryan said, I'm uh, the author of a web framework called Edge. And that's actually how I came to uh, learn about asynchronous I.O. Uh, because um, so I used a framework called Hyper, which uh, you might be familiar with. And it actually switched from synchronous I.O. to asynchronous I.O. So, um, before we start uh, talking about asynchronous I.O., I think it's important to talk about synchronous I.O., actually. Because that's what you do. Um, uh, that's what you do in Rust. Uh, you know, out of the box, you have two uh, two traits: one to read, one to write. And the typical use is that you're going to uh, read bytes from uh, a stream into a buffer. You're going to process those bytes, um, create a response, and then send um, this response uh, back to um, by writing to the stream. Right. So. By default, all of, all of these are blocking, right? So when you want to handle multiple connections, obviously you cannot, uh, you cannot use just one thread. You have to create like one thread per connection. So it's the, uh, the architecture of a synchronous I/O application is um, like you spawn one or more processes listening on a port, and then each process uh, will have um, like one thread per connection, right? So if you have n connections, then you're going to have uh, n threads. And, um, right. So how does that look in Rust? Well, it, uh, it looks like this. So that's pretty much the way that, um, that the architecture was presented. So you have a listener that uh, you bind to a, um, an IP address and a port. And um, then for each incoming connection, uh, on, the, on the current thread, you're going to uh, spawn a new thread and handle the connection there, right? So what's the difference with um, asynchronous I.O.? So with asynchronous I.O., you have a fixed set of threads, and each thread actually handles a set of connections. So you have like um, so a set of sockets, I'm in the context of networking, and the event loop is going to poll uh, to see uh, each socket whether it needs to be uh, whether it can be read from or written to, and um, and then it will execute these operations using uh, non-blocking uh, non-blocking calls, right? Um, okay. So what are uh, what are the advantages of the asynchronous I/O architecture? Um, so there are three main advantages. Uh, in terms of throughput, the number of requests per second that we can uh, execute. Uh, in terms of latency, so you can um, you can respond to requests uh, faster. And in terms of memory consumption, and uh, it turns out that's especially the case in web servers. So some folks at uh, DreamHost actually made these benchmarks um, to see what the difference would be between Apache, Lighty, and Nginx, and um, Apache is this um, traditional synchronous I/O architecture, and despite being uh, quite much slower than the other two, it consumes much more memory. Right. Um, so, um, so earlier uh, William uh, mentioned uh, Paul and uh, and Select, and actually it's interesting to uh, look a bit about the history of asynchronous. So it didn't start with Node.js, and it's actually much, much more older than I originally thought. And this is one of the good things of doing a talk, so you can actually you know, dive deep in, in history. 
And actually, I, I'm not even sure I was born when SELECT was, uh, was implemented in BSD. And later on, they added a poll system call that eventually came to Linux in 1997. And something interesting that happened uh, in 2000 for BSD and 2002 for Linux is that we started to get uh, alternative implementation. Um, so for Linux, EPOL, the main difference is scalability, right? So this is uh, a figure by the, the person who implemented uh, EPOL in the Linux kernel. And so the difference is that the performance of EPOL will just remain constant uh, no matter what the number of the file descriptors you'll be polling, whether, whereas Paul will, uh, will just, you know, get much, much slower. Okay. Um, so, just something to keep in, in mind when you're using asynchronous I.O., because, you know, it all sounds like magic, and uh, we know uh, there's always something behind magic. And um, the only disadvantage, or the main disadvantage, depending on your point of view, is that um, since you're using one thread that manages many connections, uh, many connections, and you have to handle this connection uh, in, a, in a timely manner, right? So, if on the left, uh, you have the synchronous approach where you receive connections, and um, the, the time you, it takes you to handle those connections, um, let's assume, for instance, your handler is going to fetch data from the other side of the planet, it's going to take like one second to handle a connection, but then it's okay, because you have uh, multiple threads, and so you know, the kernel will act automatically switch from one thread to the other, and so on. But in asynchronous mode, um, so what happens instead is that if the first connection uh, is handled, the thread will like, do its thing, and then only when it has finished processing this, uh, this request will process the second one, and so on. So, do not block the current thread. Um, with that being said, um, let's, see, um, let's see how you do asynchronous I.O. in Rust. So, the good news is there's actually non-blocking I.O. in the Rust standard library since uh, Rust 1.9, that was uh, last May. Um, so, the difference is that uh, when you ha instead of having a call that would block, Instead, the call would return an error saying, you know, I cannot perform this, the operation because, you know, it would block and you told me not to block, right? Um, the problem is that there's no polling API. So, but luckily, um, there's a crate for that. So, um, we, we saw that earlier. So, this is uh, MEO um, standing, that stands for Metal IO and um, it supports asynchronous polling. And the way it does that is by, um, by using the, underla the underlying libraries, um, so ePoll on Linux, KQ on BSD, and on Windows, the I.O. completion ports. And it's called Metal I.O. for a reason, right? Because it's low level, it's uh, zero allocation, and it uses callbacks with tokens. Now, um, the thing with low level is also that, you know, when you use it directly, it kind of, you know, so this is, uh, this is actually from the, um, the examples folder on, on their GitHub repository, and that's just for an eco server, and that's just handling the connection for an eco server. So eco server is, yeah, you send data, and you get that data back. And this is only the part uh, to declare the structure and to uh, to write data to uh, to it. Um, so you know maybe there are some specific cases where it's interesting to uh, use Maya directly, but in practice, what I would recommend is that uh, you use another crate on top of it that would actually take some of the pain away or even most of the pain away. Um, so. Um, I've mentioned a few crates here that are uh, using Mayo as the underlying library. Um, so features like things such as Rotor, uh, Miyoko, or Koyo. So these two are using a coroutine approach um, to, to do the asynchronous I.O. And um, the last crate that actually was uh, published quite recently uh, is called Tokyo. And this is the, the, um, the library I will talk about uh, in the rest of this talk. So, why Tokyo? Well, it has, it 
combines a few distinctive features um, that are quite interesting. And uh, the first one being there's no need to register your interest. So what that means is that uh, you, don't, you don't need to say, hey, look, I'm interested in read events, or you're interested in write events, or any of those. Tokyo will just infer this uh, for you. Based on how you use the code, um, it will know that you want to read later on, that you want to write later on. And also, it's a futures-based asynchronous I.O. Um, library. So um, those of you who use uh, Node.js and probably maybe most people in the room um, know what futures are, are maybe in, under the name of promise. Um, the idea is that um, it's a deferred computation. It means that it's a piece of code that will get executed uh, at uh, some point later in time. Uh, also, it has the nice advantage of solving what we call callback hell. Um, uh, are you familiar with callback hell? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, um, so just to, to get back a bit on the, on the, um, the callbacks and the, the interest thing. So this is, um, this is uh, in, I'm not sure it's in the latest uh, branch of Hyper. Uh, so this was, this was the hyper, um, hyper solution, maybe how you should define a handler uh, for you know, handling HTTP requests. Right? So what you would do is that you, you would need to implement this trait, and you would get called back when the, there was a request coming in, and you need to say, OK, uh, now, uh, based on you know, if this request is a post, uh, then I want to read again from the transport because I will get some data, I will get a form, I will get JSON or whatever. And then it will call on request readable. So at this point you need to say, okay, you know, maybe I want to write a response or end. And it kind of you know, gets not very natural or it's a bit clumsy. Yeah. But you know, yeah, um, so the, the author of, of Hyper didn't really have a choice because at the time he was using uh, Rotor and is now actually also moving to, to Tokyo. So um, uh, moving, moving back to, um, to futures, uh, like I said, uh, this kind of you know helps you. Um, go back from you know, go solving the callback hell instead of having nested calls and code that's you know, not very structured, you end up having this nice, beautiful, flat uh, structure. And it, it kind of in, it maps quite well, I think, to, to the way Rust already does um, you know, the iterators and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so the way the future is defined is uh, oh, the poll, OK. so. Yeah, it's unfortunate a bit. But. So the poll method, uh, so there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trait with a single method um, that uh, you implement. And um, so this method returns a result that's uh, an async. So either there's an error, and then you know, return an error, and OK. But if it's fine, then you have two choices. You know, if um, data is uh, is not ready yet, maybe you uh, you depend on uh, another call. You're waiting for some data to arrive. You're waiting for another computation to complete. Then you say, "Okay, I'm not ready yet." Or um, you can actually return a result, and then you return async ready with a value. So there's also um, um, this, the same concept, but extended for uh, iterators, and it's called stream. So that's a, a non-blocking iterators. And um, the idea is that um, so um, you return either some value when you're ready to do so, or you return known, and known means that it's the end of the iterator. Right? So what's the relation uh, between futures? Oh, no, that's OK. Um, I thought it was in the next slide coming. But. So um, also, just a quick note about futures and uh, not blocking. Um, so a future should not block, just uh, like we saw with, uh, with asynchronous I.O. in general. 
Um, there's a wait uh, function that's available on the future trades that you should not call uh, when you are inside a future because otherwise um, it will just wait and not uh, advance um, in the current thread. So actually, I made that mistake once, so um, yeah. Um, but what if your program needs to do uh, compute intensive work or uh, to call blocking functions? Things like maybe resolving a DNS, uh, a DNS hostname to an IP address, this kind of stuff. Uh, well, then you should use a thread pool. Um, so instead of spawning a new thread, every time you need to do uh, to call a blocking function, which can be a bit you know heavy handed, then you just submit a job as a closure to a thread pool, and this job will get uh, picked up and executed by one of the threads that's available. So there are. Um, the, the notion of thread pool also exists outside of uh, futures. Uh, it just turns out that there's uh, um, an implementation of thread pools for futures, um, which is called futures CPU pool. Okay, so um, so the way that futures and uh, Tokyo integrate is that um, so at the lowest level, we get Mio that handles all this uh, low-level stuff, right? Uh, all the callbacks, all the tokens. Um, then Tokyo Core takes care of um, registering the interest and exposing the future-based event loop. Um, on top of that, you also have higher, higher level services, Tokyo Proto and Tokyo Service, and we'll get uh, to that later on. Um, so just a little bit of uh, history about, uh, about um, Tokyo. Uh, it, it actually it, uh, started in August 2014, so that's uh, um, a bit over two years ago. And the author of Mio is actually the author of Tokyo also, so that's, um, uh, so that's a, yeah. And um, we, we see in March this year, the futures are created, is, uh, is created. And then in August this year, a number of interesting things happen. So on August 3rd, uh, Tokyo is announced. You know, um, so there's a new story in Rust for doing asynchronous IO, which is very promising, etc. And about a week later, there's this crate called uh, Futures that's uh, officially announced. And uh, yeah, it's a new way of doing uh, you know, non-blocking calls. and. Uh, and deferred computation, and it actually turns out there's a, a crate as part of future that's called Futures Mayo that looks very good for doing asynchronous IO also. And so, you know, um, so I was in holidays at this time, and I was thinking about how I'm going, what I'm going to say uh, during this talk, and I was uh, thinking about talking about other stuff that I had to do in my web framework. Um, and I see that actually, you know, it's it's changing things because it starts to look, you know, very uh, very interesting to do, do asynchronous I/O in, in a much simpler way, right? And luckily, um, about two weeks after Futures RS is announced, then um, the the three authors, so they are, so that's Aaron Turon, Alex Christian for Futures RS, and Carl Lerke for Mayo, um, announced together the emerging parts of the project, so that. Uh, Futures Mayo actually becomes Tokyo Core, and they are integrated, uh, and it now plays ni nicely together. Um, all, all right, so uh, some actual Rust code to see, um, you know, uh, how the event loop is um, is implemented with Tokyo. Um, so we got what's called the, um, the core of the reactor. I don't know if that is uh, that if that's uh, intended. To Probably yes. Um, so the core of the reactor is really like um, the heart of this. So you create an, uh, the event loop. You start listening on an IP address and a port. And so what's uh, what's next is that uh, you can the incoming method on listener returns a stream of connection. That's, so that's a non-blocking stream. And for each stream, you run a closure. And um, the first method actually returns a future. And that future is executed on the event loop. Right. Um, so to do actual handling of the connection, uh, you need to put that in the call to the for each method. And that looks like this. So, um, 
so you get a stream that's an incoming connection that somebody connected to uh, your server. And what you're going to do is that you're going to spawn a future on the event loop. So the event loop will actually run um, the main listener future that's, um, that's running your code whenever an incoming connection arrives. And it will also uh, run every closure that you, every, every future that you create to handle um, the connection. And it works, and it's great. Um, so let's see. Maybe it's uh, maybe let's see it in action. Uh, so I've chosen a, a use case for this, uh, which is the identification protocol, um, which I think is now. I'm I don't know if it's still used outside of IRC. Um, so the idea is that. Um, is that it was originally intended, I think, in the context of FTP or something like this. And um, the idea is that the, the client that you're connected to wants to know who you are. So um, they will send you a request uh, with a pair of ports, and you will just uh, reply with that pair of ports, the operating system, and the username who's currently uh, using the connection. And it's a simple uh, request response uh, line based protocol. Uh, which is nice enough to you know make, make some experimentation. Um, so I think at this point I have. Uh, uh, is, you can see this, yeah. Okay, so I will. Um, so if you if you send like uh, okay um, zero zero, obviously it's an invalid port. Uh, if you say okay uh, one one, then there's no user because there's no connection from uh, port one to port one. And if you point to an actual connection, uh, like this one, then it returns the user ID and the operating system. And uh, yeah. So how do we do this uh, with Tokyo? So first, uh, the first solution, I'm uh, using only Tokyo Core. If you remember, there is like a higher level, um, higher level layers. So this one is just the base layer, and I implemented the future trade directly. And what I want to do is just read a line, um, you know, try, uh, and if it fails, I just return an error. Um, so I read a line, and then I will process that request, uh, get a reply, and then write all uh, the bytes of this reply to the stream. Then clear the request, and I return that I'm not ready yet to finish because there might still be some bytes available. So this function, when it returns, actually Tokyo will um, Tokyo will see whether there, are, there is still data pending, and uh, if it does, it will just call me again, and then you know it just loops like this until there are no more no more uh, bytes to read. At which point I return OK, async, I'm ready with a unit result. So uh, the connection um, terminates. So there are just um, a few problems with this implementation. So the first one is that I used a buffer reader because I was, uh, this was the easiest solution to read a line, but it actually turns out that the buffer reader will try to, uh, will, will actually call read until and will try to fill a buffer, and that buffer is eight kilobytes. And obviously just a request for a few bytes uh, is not enough to fill the buffer, so read returns an error saying it would block. Also, write all could also block, but that's um, probably less of an issue here. But it, in, th in theory, it could also block. Um, so, write, it turns out write would not block, but it might, only write, um, it might only write a part of the data. So, you don't want to use that if you want all the response to, to get sent back to the client. So there are possible solutions to improve uh, the implementation. Uh, such as using intermediate buffers. So you fill a buffer, and whenever there is a line, a line um, separator, then you will process the request, and using the same thing for um, the right side. And you can do that, and it works perfectly. Or you can use uh, streams. So you transform, uh, you transform the incoming bytes into a stream of into a, a stream of strings and handle this with a future also. There's another solution that uses Tokyo service, um, which is 
kind of a bit higher level than this. And actually, it, it looks like what you might want to do um, with what I, will, I just described. So the idea of the Tokyo service architecture is that you, you no longer have just uh, data, um, bytes coming in, bytes coming out. You will actually um, parse those bytes into whatever structure you want to, like a request. And this is transport layer, and then the request gets, uh, gets given to the service layer where you do the actual handling of data. And the handle transforms the request into a response, and then the response gets sent um, down to the transport layer, and finally uh, it gets serialized into bytes and sent uh, on the stream. So impl to implement transport, it's just a matter of uh, implementing two traits. One is called parse, the other one is called serialize. So there's each, um, each trait as a, as a single method. And you just say what's uh, for parsing, you say what the type of the data you're going, you're going to produce. You get a buffer and you can return or not um, that, uh, that structure. And for serialize is the inverse operation where you get um, where you get the structure, and you want to describe how you're going to send it, uh, at, you're going to serialize it to a buffer. Um, all right, so now all that's left to do is do the actual service implementation. And so for that, I'm using um, a little helper function from Tokyo called simple service. Because, um, so the service trait, um, I don't know if some of you actually use the service trait directly. Um, and the service trait has like, I think, uh, four parameter types, input, output, and the future type, maybe the error type. And it's just a lot to implement, um, like four lines of code. So the simple service, what it does is that it will create an instance uh, of, a, of a simple service from, um, from a closure that returns a future. It's slightly simplified because otherwise it would not fit on the screen. There's like uh, the bit uh, implementation details, I'd say. But the idea, the idea is like this. You define a service um, as, a, as a simple service. From a closure, you uh, instantiate the transport. And uh, finally, you create the service, the server using the service and the transport. And this, uh, this piece of code actually goes uh, in the heart of the event loop. And it means that every time you get a connection, you will create the transport for that connection, create the service for that, and pass it to this pipeline server, which is uh, done um, by Tokyo itself. And um, to conclude this talk about asynchronous I.O., so as we've seen at the beginning, it leads to higher performance, uh, at least it does for web servers, probably um, like uh, with, with low-level, uh, hard real-time constraints. Apparently, it's a bit uh, different, at least using I.O. or higher-level stuff. But um, at least for, for networking, it, it, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And there's a rapidly evolving ecosystem, uh, especially, uh, as I said, what happened in just in August. And so things are, are moving quickly. But I, I think that uh, the support in Rust is at a turning point uh, in the sense that futures uh, look actually great to use. And Tokyo is also very, very interesting. So probably the next steps that's, um, that you could do, for instance, is try to play with it. Um, you know, use a simple example, maybe uh, use futures uh, to replace blocking implementations in crates, you know, um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening, and uh, if we have time for questions, uh, yeah, feel free. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to announce we have time for one question. So, yeah. <laughs> who has it? It's out there. There it is. Hi. Hi. Um, so I, I've played with some, some I think uh, I owe in, in Rust before. 
using Mayo. So basically, the, the WebSocket uh, AWS for us, right? Uh, what I'm wondering about, about uh, just using features is can you use the same event loop for different types of events, basically? So for example, can I have like the same event loop handle like connections and maybe some like deferred calls I want to do inside the connection? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, um, your question. Uh, okay, so, yeah. so the, the event loop, like you, you, you write the handler for, for the, like for, for handling a connection, right? Can that, can the same event uh, loop handle like a different type? So not, uh, not just a network connection, but also like just a deferred call or something like that? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, so you mean different protocols in the same event loop, or? Different protocols or, or just different, just different types of like callbacks, or if you will. So I think in theory it's entirely possible because, you know, um, I know that uh, Rotor, the, um, the crate on top of Mayo, is, does exactly that. So it, it, it allows you to, you know, have uh, uh, maybe HTTP and HTTPS in the same thread. Um, I'm not sure how to do that in Tokyo, actually. So I, m maybe it's possible, maybe it's not possible, but I, I really honestly have no idea. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, thank you, Mathieu. You're welcome. And everybody, round of applause. Thank you.